Okay, if you're a note taker, take out your notes and your pens, and um, I hope you can keep up because I'm moving today. Um, Here we go. Acts chapter 13, verse 14. But Paul and Barnabas traveled inland to Antioch of Pisidia. If you remember from months ago when we were preaching about this, there's like 20 different cities in the ancient world called Antioch. That's why it's got to tell you which one. This is not the Antioch. That's the home church of Paul and Barnabas, by the way. They're traveling to a new missionary city. Um, They're going to try and plant a church there. On the Sabbath, they went to the synagogue for the services. And after the usual readings from the books of Moses and the prophets, those in charge of the service sent them this message. Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, come and give it. So Paul and Barnabas go to the synagogue, the Jewish synagogue. Why do they go there? Start there. Because Paul's a former Pharisee and he knows the Old Testament really well. Play to your strengths, right? So he goes to the synagogue, goes there on Sabbath, and they're already reading. And they give them an opportunity to speak. And Paul's about to speak to some fellow Jews And the way he's going to do his sermon, and it's about to start, the way he's going to start this sermon is with a history lesson from the Old Testament. He's going to replay God's greatest hits back to his chosen people. Make sense? Verse 17, here's the beginning. The God of this nation of Israel chose our ancestors and made them multiply and grow strong during their stay in Egypt. And then with a powerful arm, he led them out of their slavery He put up with them. Say he put up with them. You ever put up with anybody? You ever wake up and realize God's putting up with you? Come on, come on. He put up with them through 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. Then God destroyed seven nations in Canaan and gave their land to Israel as an inheritance, the promised land. And all this took about 450 years. After that, God gave them judges to rule until the time of Samuel the prophet. And then the people begged God for a king and God gave them Saul. Just a tiny thing on that. They're in the promised land. They become the nation of Israel and they've got these judges. If you remember like Gideon and Samson and Deborah and people like that. And they were spiritual leaders and political leaders all at the same time. And then the people wanted a king and God warns them at the time, I'm not sure you want a king because Because kings tend to be greedy. Kings tend to be selfish. But they wanted a king anyway because the rest of the world had kings. And so they get a king. They get Saul. And Saul's not a good king if you know the story. So getting Saul wasn't a good chapter. But God's going to remove him. Verse 22, God removed Saul, replaced him with David. A man after, about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything that I want him to do. And it is one of King David's descendants, Jesus, who is God's promised savior of Israel. So, so this is really a greatest hit in their history, right? He says, we had a bad king, but the second one came along. It was David and David is the best king ever in history. He's a man after God's own heart. The reason he's the best king is because not only is he good politically, but he's good in his character because his character reflected the character of God mostly. Most of the time, except when it didn't, right? Because he was also human and he was also fallen. So he had some great moments, David did. And he wrote the book of Psalms. And we see the heart of God coming through the words of the book of Psalms back to us. But, but, but he had some moments of failure too. But Jesus, who would come through his line, will not have moments of failure. So when David is king and he starts to reflect the heart of God, one of the promises God makes to David is that the the, the kingship will never leave your physical line on this earth. And ultimately a king will come through your line, David, that will be the Messiah, that will be the forever king. It says in Jeremiah 23, five, I don't have this on your screens. It says, for the time is coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up a righteous descendant from King David's line. He will be a king who rules with wisdom. He will do what is just. He will do what is right throughout the land. And Paul says, Jesus came as the fulfillment of that. He would be the Messiah. Paul says he will be the savior of Israel. Now, savior is the theme of Paul's sermon 
Has it hit you yet that we're doing a sermon about somebody else's sermon yet? So Paul's sermon, it's got a theme because all good sermons do. The theme that runs through Paul's sermon is savior or salvation, that we need to be saved. And they've got to be wondering at this point, saved from what, Paul? Saved from what? Well, the obvious answer to those people at that time would have been saved from Rome because they were under Roman occupation and that was a bad thing for them. And so when you say he's going to be our savior, surely you mean he's going to be a political savior and he's going to fight for us and we're going to get free on this earth. Of course, that's not what Paul means. Verse 24, but Jesus came. John the Baptist preached that all of the people of Israel needed to repent of their sin and turn to God and be baptized. It feels like Paul kind of went backwards here for just a second. He was talking about Jesus and now he stops and talks about John. John the Baptist is the forerunner of Jesus. He's the one who prepared the way, if you remember. Verse 25, as John was finishing his ministry, he asked, do you think that I'm the Messiah? And John said, no, I'm not. But he is coming soon. And I'm not even worthy to be his slave or untie the sandals of his feet. Now, why does Paul give us this? He stops and he gives us this because John the Baptist is one of the last, he is the last actually Old Testament prophet. He's the one who came and his job was to prepare God's people for the coming of Jesus and then to testify that Jesus was the Messiah. And John did. He says, I'm not him. And some of the people here in Antioch that were listening to Paul and Barnabas preach, they would have known about John the Baptist. They would have heard about him. Some of them might have even been baptized by John. So Paul coming in and saying, John wasn't it, but the Messiah is here. And John testified about that and used the word Messiah. That's massive to these Jewish people. Verse 26, brothers, he says, you sons of Abraham, and also you God-fearing Gentiles. God-fearing Gentiles, there is a phrase that means anybody who's not a natural born Jew, but at the same time, they love Yahweh and they've come to worship Yahweh. So it's both, both groups. He says, this message of salvation has been sent to us. Say to us, to us. The message of salvation, it's for us. The gift is for us. God had said the savior was coming and now it's here and it's for us. Massive. Again, does it mean freedom from Roman, Roman occupation? No. Verse 27, the people in Jerusalem and their leaders did not recognize Jesus as the one that the prophets had spoken about. Instead, they condemned Jesus to die. And in doing this, they fulfilled the prophet's words that are read every Sabbath. They found no legal reason to execute him, but they asked Pilate to have him killed anyway. And when they had done all that the prophecy said about Jesus, they took him down from the cross and they placed him in a tomb. The story takes a dark turn. The Messiah has come. The savior of us has come. But look at what our leaders did back in Jerusalem. And Paul just, he just goes for it. He's like, some of these leaders that you've heard about, that you look up to and that you respect, maybe even since you were a little kid, these are the same people that saw the Messiah come in their time and they rejected him. The truth was right in front of them and they rejected him and they didn't just reject him. They partnered with the Rome that you hate, by the way, that's Pilate. They cooperated with Rome to have him killed. These are big accusations that Paul is making right now. I got to imagine if you were in that synagogue at that point, you're starting to get a little bit fired up. You're starting to get a little bit worried. Wait a second. Are people killed the Messiah? Yes. Yes, they did. And it fulfilled the prophecies that he went to a cross. Now, before we get to the good news part, because it's coming, I got to stop for a second. Why did Jesus go to a cross? Let's explain. Here's the deal. In the Old Testament, when they sinned, they would make a sacrifice and, and an innocent animal, its blood would be shed, yes? And, and no matter how you feel about animals and all that kind of stuff, that's just what they did. And it was a picture of the innocent must die in order to take the punishment for the person who has sinned. That was the picture. And that was one time only. And they would have to do it again and again and again every single time that they sinned. Jesus came and he took on a cross willingly. He gave up his life. Why did he do it? 
because he was saying, I will suffer and die on this cross to take care of all the sins of all humanity. Once for all, Hebrews says, once for all. So when Jesus did that, he was such a perfect sacrifice. He was sinless. He was innocent. He was righteous before God. And that kind of a perfect sacrifice, willingly giving himself up for you as a substitution, as a ransom, he took on all the sins for all time. So if you're a Christian here today, you have been forgiven by Jesus Christ. And that's all your sins in your past, your present, and your future. Amen. God is good. Amen. Amen. Jesus allowed himself to die so that we don't have to die. Hmm. Sometimes people ask the question. It's actually one of the most common questions about God. Why does God allow suffering in the world? And many times the question is maybe the one big thing that's holding them back from a surrender to Jesus Christ. If God is so good, if God is so powerful, why does he allow all of this that I see? The darkness, the selfishness, the cruelty, the violence. And of course, it's not just all that stuff that's out there. It's my family member who had cancer. It's, it, it's the car wreck that happened in our family. It's, it, it's, it's the really big, very personal, very close stuff to us that gets us fired up about that question. Have I got you here now? It's massive. And I've read all the books on philosophy, okay? Not all of them. <laughs> Goodness. Uh, anyway, um, Philosophy's got all kinds of answers for this. One of the big answers that philosophers will come and tell you is, hey, listen, if, if you had all the power that God has and you got to choose about suffering, yeah, you'd probably put a stop to all the suffering that you see. But if you didn't just have the power of God, but you also had the wisdom of God and you had the knowledge that God has, and you had God's patience and you had God's love and you had God's mercy and you had God's justice and you had God's full character, you would find yourself coming to the same exact conclusions about suffering that God has come to. Amen. And that's true, but it's cold. It's true, but it's cold. Because as a pastor, I don't walk into hospital rooms and give them philosophical answers, I can tell you that. And you wouldn't want it in a hospital room or at a funeral, would you? No, it's too cold. I would say the real answer to that question is the cross of Jesus Christ. The real answer to why does God allow suffering in the world? I don't understand why he chose this and didn't choose this thing over here. Why? What's really behind our why question is, is God distant and cold and unfeeling toward us? But how do we know it's no? Because he took on a cross. Because he came near. Because he decided to become human. And when he decided to become human and to suffer the way that we suffer and walk the way that we walk, he is, is proving beyond the shadow of a doubt that he is not unfeeling. He is not distant. He's right here. He showed us. And when he took on a cross and he decided to suffer in every single way that we suffer, not just physical pain, not just torture. We talked last week about the fact that they stripped him naked and they shamed him in front of others. And this is the only innocent person that ever lived. Did he deserve that? No. The betrayal of, of one of his closest friends. You've been through betrayal. You know that pain. God knows that pain. Jesus knows that pain. He went through all that pain for you. You've been mocked. He's been mocked. I don't know if I should say this or not. This week at the Olympics, there was some stuff that took, took place. I'm not going to go into it, but just to say some Christians felt like they had been mocked. Let me just say this. When our Lord was mocked, he was at his highest point of victory. Amen. When he was mocked, he did not fight back. Nope. The scripture says that he did not speak back. He was like a lamb to the slaughter. And in the midst of that, he was at his strongest, 
at his most loving and at his most victorious because he is the king of an upside down kingdom. He has suffered in all ways that we suffer. And it is his suffering that speaks to us with not with, not with cold philosophy, but he shows us, I have gone exactly where you have gone. God is not unfeeling to us. He is not aloof. Verse 30, Paul continues, but God raised him from the dead. And over a period of many days, he appeared to those who had gone with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to the people of Israel. And now we are here to bring you this good news. The promise was made to our ancestors and God has now fulfilled it for us, their descendants by raising Jesus. What Paul is giving them here is is what they call in the justice system, a chain of evidence, a a chain of custody of evidence. It's the idea that we don't just want evidence. We want to know exactly in whose hands the evidence went, how it got from point A to point B to point C, so that we know that nobody tampered with it. Was it all good? Can we trust it? That's a chain of evidence. Paul's coming here and he's saying, Jesus rose from the dead. And when Jesus rose from the dead, that becomes the center point of proof of Christianity. How can you trust any of it? He came from, he rose from the dead. Show me somebody else that came strolling out of a tomb after they died. This is massive. And not only did it happen, but Paul is very, very clear. He helps them understand. He's like, when he came, he showed himself to many people in Jerusalem who had already seen him dead. That's big. First Corinthians goes on to tell us that when Jesus rose from the dead, he was on this earth for 40 days before he ascended into heaven. And across that 40 days, he had many meetings where he had made many appearances to many different people. At one point, he appeared to more than 500 people at the same time. And Paul's like, there's people from Jerusalem to Galilee, and they're all strolling around saying, I saw him. I saw him too. Like that's, sometimes people look at Christianity in the first century and they're like, how in the world did this sudden thing that goes against so much that these people grew up with, how did they turn the ancient world upside down the way that they did? And it's so quick, it's like a brush fire because he rose from the dead and they all saw him. They saw him die and then they saw him alive again and they knew they were in the middle of something very different. Amen. And so Paul says, listen, they were there They all saw, and he's like, and now we're here before you all the way over in Antioch, and we're telling you we saw too. How did Paul see on the Damascus road, if you've studied this? He had his own moment with Jesus Christ where he heard his voice and he saw him. Paul is sitting there saying, I'm an eyewitness to the resurrected Jesus. And I'm standing in front of you and I'm preaching to you. That's massive. Chain of evidence. Verse 38, brothers, listen, we are here to proclaim that through this man, Jesus, there is forgiveness for your sins. Everyone who believes in Jesus is made right in God's sight, something the law of Moses could never do. So he's caught up with the story. And now Paul's shifting into telling you what the gospel means. And he's saying you can be forgiven and you can be forgiven all the way. So now they know We're not talking about salvation from the Romans here. We're talking about salvation from ourselves. Salvation from our past. Salvation from our shame. Salvation from all of it. Ever do anything wrong? (laughs) You can be made fully right, he says, in God's sight. What a promise. Something the Old Testament law could never do. Now, don't misunderstand. In the Old Testament, they had forgiveness. And I mentioned this briefly before. If, if you sinned, what you would do is you would go, and you, you were told this in the law of Moses, you were, you were told to go and confess your sin to God. And you did. You confessed it verbally, out loud, to God. God, I did this thing. Please forgive me, God. And then, then you were instructed to go and to make your sacrifice in the temple. And once you made your sacrifice in the temple, that innocent blood covered over your sin, you'd already confessed it to God. You were now forgiven. That's the way that it worked. You were forgiven for about five minutes. And then what? Well, you know then what? 
then you'd sin again, right? And once you sinned again, then you'd have to start the process all over again. There's no actually settled forgiveness in that. There's no real peace with God in the midst of that. You're, you're in and you're out. You're in and you're out. One pastor said, it's amazing they didn't run out of animals. Really? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. What, what a difficult kind of religious life to have with God, even though many of us look at it and we think that's what God wants from us. Failing and then earning our way back. Failing and then earning our way back. That is not the gift of Jesus Christ on the cross for you. True forgiveness is what he's talking about. Romans 3.28, not on your screen, says, so we are made right with God through faith and not by obeying the law. Not by obeying the law. You must have faith in Jesus. You must surrender your life to him. Romans 10, 9, and 10, that if you will declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you will be saved. You surrender your entire soul, your entire eternity, everything that you are, you surrender it to God. Martin Luther calls it the great exchange. God, you can have all of me so that I can have all of you. And it's not a good deal for him. (laughs) But it is what he wants because he loves you. Amen. It's what he wants because he loves you. You can be clean. You can be free. But it's not by keeping the Ten Commandments. And let's be real. For many of us, this is good news. But for some of us, it's not good news. And the reason it's not good news is because... What I just told you was that you don't get to earn your way to God. And for some of us, that messes with us. Wait a second. I don't get to try. I don't get to Mother Teresa myself back to Jesus. Right? Because that's, that's the way it's been explained, right? Like, like I do all the bad stuff and that weighs the scales down. And then I want to come back and I want to do all the, these good deeds in order to rebalance it out. And what sounds so great about that picture is that I get to do it. I get to earn it. I get to claw and climb my way back to God and stand back from it at the end and say, I did it. You hear what that is? It's pride. It's what we want. It's, it's self-accomplishment. That's what we want. And that's what they wanted in the Old Testament too. You don't get to accomplish it with Jesus ever. And so you are not left with pride. You're left with gratitude. Amen. And you're left with worship. And that can be tough. But that's what the gospel is. That same verse that we just read, I, I want to read it to you out of the ESV. It's another translation, but I just, I like the way it structures it here. Total forgiveness in Jesus. By him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by the law of Moses. It just, it just takes it and says, these are the two alls that are right here in this verse. Everyone and everything. So everyone is set free. There's no person excluded. No one. And there is no sin that can't be dealt with. Amen. No sin. No matter how evil that sin was that you did. No matter how much of that sin you did or how much sinning you did before you came to Jesus... As much as you might have a voice inside of you that says, Pastor, I'm the exception and I'm just too dark and evil for God to forgive me, wrong. That verse said otherwise. It said everyone for everything is freed. So I'm not trying to make your sin small. I'm trying to make the forgiveness of Jesus big today because the power, the forgiveness, the heart, the love of Jesus is big. You are free. So Paul has preached his sermon and he's got one more thing to say to us. One more thing. And then he's done. Then it's altar call time. One more thing. Steve Jobs, the leader of Apple Computer, used to say one more thing. I used to be in technology, so I followed all that kind of stuff a whole lot. So he'd, he'd come out and he'd have his big press conference and he'd roll out all the different Apple products for the year. And you think he was done. And then he would say, but I got one more thing. And then he would unveil some crazy product that would change the world, right? And everybody's like, oh my gosh, one more thing. You know, and then 
that one more thing would wreck our kids and our eyesight and our self-confidence and send us all into anxiety and depression. One more thing. Paul's got one more thing and it's not an iPhone. Amen? It's okay. It's okay. Verse 40, his one more thing is right here. He says, be careful. Be careful. Don't let the prophet's words apply to you. For they said, look, you mockers, be amazed and die. For I'm doing something in your own day. Something that you wouldn't believe, even if somebody told you about it. Be careful. Paul gives this whole beautiful salvation message and he comes to the end of it and says, be careful. Why? Be careful is what you say to somebody when they're standing on the edge of a cliff. Be careful. Careful how you step. Careful how you move. That was, that was us at the uh, Grand Canyon. That's my daughter right there sitting at the edge. Don't you want to run up to her and say, be careful? <laughs> And she's just hanging out, you know, with her backpack and her, her, her stuff there. Ah, be careful. Be careful because there's danger. Be careful because you might. Be careful you might not mean to. Be careful. The time is short. Be careful. Be careful how you respond to this. Be careful. Go back to what Paul was saying there in verse 41. Look, you mockers, he says, be amazed and die for I'm doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if somebody told you about it. This is a quote. This is a direct quote that Paul gives them. And it's from the book of Habakkuk. And the words might shock you a little bit. Look, you mockers, be amazed and die. Let me unpack that for you. Sometimes we find ourselves sitting in the seat of mockers and we don't mean to. Sometimes you're sitting in the seat of a mocker and, and you just think you're just being human. You just think it's being normal. But here's the thing. <laughs> the way that we live mocks God. Yep. And I'm in the deep end of the pool right now. But your bank accounts mock God. Your retirement mocks God. Your agenda and your plans, your career ambitions Mock God. It, it is you saying, I will run things my own way, even though you've told me a different way, God. There's many ways that we find ourselves mocking God. C.S. Lewis, one of my favorites, he had an essay that he wrote one, one time. It was called God in the Dock. God in the Dock. And here's the idea. In the British um, justice system, when, when they go into a courtroom, They've got this wooden box and it comes up to about here and, and the person who's accused and who's being questioned, who's being judged is brought into this spot called the dock and that's where they stand. You can walk into any courtroom and you know exactly who the legal case is about because he's in the dock or she's in the dock. And what Lewis says is in previous generations, in ancient times, they saw themselves in the dock and God was the one that was judging them. But he said, in modern times, it's switched in the imagination of mankind. It's switched for us. We've got God in the dock and we think we're his judge. Well, I don't know if I agree with that, God. I've got questions for you, God. I, I read some things in my Bible. I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure. How, how, how did you make this decision? And we'll, we'll, just, we'll just see about this. Sometimes we even find ourselves accusing God. But it's the, it's the fundamental switch that Lewis was so concerned about. It's like, how did we put God there? And we have. And we've just grown up in it. It's been taught to us. I'm not trying to take you off the hot seat. I'm just trying to say, we're all there. And we find ourselves mocking God and wishing we could cut things out of his word and having an opinion. I get it. Paul says, for I'm doing something in your day, something that you wouldn't believe, even if someone told you about it. 
this salvation from Jesus Christ that God has designed and he's put together his way might not have been the way that you would have put it together, but it's his salvation. And this is the salvation that is before us. And it's this option or nothing. And he's put it in front of us. And, and, and he says something that you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. It's easy to not believe. It's easy to be too amazed. That's too shocking. I can't embrace it and then perish. He says, and you wouldn't believe it even if somebody told you. Can I state the obvious that someone's sitting here right now, standing here right now telling you? What does that make this? That makes this a moment of responsibility for your eternal soul. It's huge. We might miss God. Be careful. We might miss his salvation. Be careful. So why, why don't we just believe? Why don't we just surrender? Why don't we just do it? Why, why doesn't the rest of our, our week match our Sunday? Why, why, why don't we just fall on our faces before Jesus and say, you can have everything? Why do we just do it? Why, why, why do we stay in this spot of, of, of questioning and wavering and not deciding? Why would we ever be that way? I, I think there's a lot of reasons. I'll have some guesses at it. I think pride is maybe the first on my list. We talked about pride last week. You know best. You would have put this together better. You'll clean up your own life in your way. It's pride. Or we're just grown comfortable with how we are and how our life is. Man, we're pretty stubborn people, aren't we? Yeah. Like, come on, pastor. Like, give me a little church, but don't turn my spiritual life upside down, please. Yeah. Like, I feel that. We're comfortable. Or we're in a rut. You're in a rut of you've always argued with God. You've always had questions. It's, it's interesting. You go back a month or so, and I was talking about some people who've, who've had faith that they've decided too quickly, and it's kind of shallow for them because they didn't ask the questions and reason with God and have the conversations that they needed to have, do the reading. Like all of that is absolutely necessary. I'm not trying to be a used car salesman with you today and say, decide. That's not my point. But also... Some of us have gotten so used to being the questioner of God, you're stuck. And I'm trying to get you unstuck. We settle for what we've been told by parents and by teachers. Going to church on Sunday is enough that you're basically a good person, that you're going to inherit the faith of your parents or your community. All those are lies. Or you don't take what Jesus says about heaven and hell seriously. Seriously. It's not just the rest of the scripture. It's the words in red, guys. It's our savior. It's our Lord. It's the one who died for us is the one who talked about those places the most. He talked about heaven and hell as two very real destinations for the human soul. And between us and that is judgment. If we believed just a tenth of what Jesus said about those places, the reality of it, would come, come racing into our lives and it would shatter our priorities the way that they stand today. It's better not to think about it, right? Or we think we have time. One of the greatest reasons I think that people don't decide is we've got ourselves convinced that we've got time. Someday I'll work this out. Great message, but... I'm gonna go think about it. Someday we're gonna work this out. I don't know that you've got someday. Amen. You ever, um, okay, this is gonna be a sports illustration. So give me a second. Ugh. Baseball, two outfielders, <clears throat> fly ball coming toward them. They're both running toward it. You've seen it in the bloopers, right? <coughs> what do you want to do? You want to call the ball. You want to claim it. You want to own it. It's mine. And then when they don't, what's going to happen? Ball's going to fall. 
or worse yet, they're going to collide. Those are funny to watch, right? So when to put them on a loop, watch them over and over again. Indecision costs you is the point. It's about now. It's about today. It's about making a decision. Time is running out because you will not always hear the call of God in your life. You're hearing it today, but you will not always hear it. Now, I've got some scriptures up there. I'm not listing them for you because I don't want you to go into reading mode for this next section. I just want you to listen and I want to let you, I want you to let this wash over you. If you're a note taker, quick, jot those things down. First Kings 18, 21. This is Elijah talking to a group of people and he says, how much longer will you waver hobbling between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal is God, follow him. Hobbling, indeciding, there, there's no urgency in it. We just stay in the middle. First Corinthians or Second Corinthians 6, 2. Behold, now is the favorable, favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Would you say now, please? Now, now, now is the day of salvation. Amen. It's not manipulative. It's a splash of cold water. Isaiah 55, 6. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. Yeah. Hebrews 3.15. Today when you hear God's voice, don't harden your hearts as Israel did when they rebelled. Today. Say today. 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 It's now. It's today. It's urgent. Why? You won't always hear God's call. It's a weird thing to say, isn't it? Why? Because every time that you ignore God, every time you say no to him, do you know it hardens your heart? It's like adding calluses to your hands. Your sensitivity goes down to him and you find yourself not hearing him anymore. When it says today is the day of salvation, when it says now is when you have to decide, the reason it's now is not because God is leaving. It's because your opportunity to still hear him It's now. Next, time's running out because our lives can end anytime. Psalm 90 says 70 years are given to us. Some even live to 80. Some of you have made it past that, amen? <laughs> but even the best years are filled with pain and trouble. Soon they disappear and we fly away. Soon they disappear. There's a student that once approached Billy Graham. I love this. And he asked, he asked Billy Graham what was the greatest surprise of his whole life. And he said, the greatest surprise in my life is the brevity of life. I never dreamed life was going to be so short. <laughs> I was in a literature class at Illinois State University where I got my bachelor's and David Foster Wallace was the professor and, and I just remember he said this really weird thing to us. He said, you know, there's all, the, all these books that I want you to read, but I'm not gonna have you read them because you won't get them. And the reason you won't get these books is because you're all in your early 20s and you don't think you're ever gonna die. Because there's something about that youth, isn't there? You feel unstoppable. You feel invulnerable. You don't feel like it's ever going to come. That's for other people some other time. So even talking to you today, some of the young ones in here, it's like even talking to you today, it's only an act of God, a miracle of him that can penetrate that. Help you understand the urgency that's in front of you. <clears throat> I'm a pastor and I've done a lot of funerals over the years and every single person's funeral that I do, I keep the, the file of it and I, I, I name it their name. And I was looking at that file this week and just going down through the names, all of them. And I was so shocked at the number of teens, teenagers in that list. And I was shocked by the number of 20-somethings in that list, the number of 30-somethings in that list, people who thought they had 80 years. 
they didn't. And what's, what's, what's better, right? To lead you to believe that you're unstoppable or to tell you that maybe not. To tell you that you don't know tomorrow because you don't. And guys, this isn't a hard sell and this isn't manipulation. I'm trying to give you truth here. I do want you to seek God. I do want you to ask the questions. I do want you to read. But many of us in the room have believed the lie that we've got all the time in the world that you may not. James 4 says, today or tomorrow, we're going to go to a certain town and we'll stay there for a year. We'll do business there. We'll make a profit. Then James says, how do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while and then it's gone. There's a humility about our lives that we don't claim tomorrow. There's a healthy urgency that doesn't live in fear. It lives in readiness. Jesus talked about this, that his return could come at any moment. A different way that time is running out on us all. And this is the last one. But he shared a parable there in Matthew 24. And he said, you know, if there was a really fancy, wealthy house and it had servants in it. And if there was, say, it's this great thief that showed up in the middle of the night and stole everything from the house while the servants were sleeping. He's like, here's the question. If the servants knew what time the thief was going to come, wouldn't they set their alarm clocks? Yeah. They wake up right before the guy comes and they'd be meeting him at the front door. Of course. He's like, but they don't know. And so the only response is you've got to stay ready. Amen. You've got to respect time. Don't wait. So he said in verse 44, therefore you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. And then 1 Thessalonians 5 says it the same. He says, for you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly like a thief in the night when people are saying everything's peaceful and secure. Then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin. Would you stand? We think we have time, but we don't. I'm going to walk us through a prayer together and give you guys a chance to surrender your life to Christ. I'll just say this before I do. Um, If today is the day that you do surrender and you become saved, go back to the prayer team after the service or even during the last song and just ask them for a Bible. You don't have to have a big conversation. Just say, I want my Bible. He said, I could have my Bible. Give me my Bible. (laughs) Because I want you to have a Bible. It's a New Living Translation study Bible. There's a lot of notes in the bottom and it's going to explain the scripture to you as you read along. The other thing to consider is we are doing a baptism service in a few weeks. If you get saved today, the next step of obedience in your new life as Jesus being your Lord is to get water baptized. Amen. So go out to the lobby and let them know that you want to be water baptized. They'll put you on a list. They'll give you a study to do so that you really know for yourself what you're doing and why. That's so valuable. And I said it at the beginning and I'm going to remind you one more time. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ today, you are not off the hook. If you have thought I've been living for myself, someday I'm gonna start living for Jesus. Someday I'm gonna do those things that Jesus has told me to do. Someday I'm gonna align my life with the one who saved me already. Someday I'm gonna follow the calling that he's already called me to do. Healthy urgency, folks. Now, Today, amen? Amen. 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 Now's the time. So bow your heads and close your eyes. And we're going to have this prayer. If you're part of this prayer today, 
If you want to be included in this prayer today, I'm going to ask you to take a step. It's a small step. I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And you're just saying, Pastor, I'm praying this with you right now. And I'm going to give you a moment, but not a long one. But raise that hand and raise it high. Because it's the action steps that help us really go forward with God. So one, two, three, put them up for real. Amen. 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 All across this room, we're going to pray this one phrase at a time. You say these in your heart to God, Lord Jesus, forgive my sins. Forgive my past. Make me clean. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you for making me right with God. Come into my life. Take over. I give my days to you. I give my future to you. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. In Christ's name, amen. And now as believers, we will also pray. Lord Jesus, there is no greater sermon ever preached than the cross of Jesus Christ. When you suffered for us, you showed us that God came near and that when he said he loves us, he was for real about it. Lord, let us see that. Let it comfort us. Let it inspire us, God, to follow you, Jesus. You are beautiful, Lord. Thank you for this opportunity today. In Christ's name, amen.